Amen. Amen. I love the songs that remind us why we are thankful. And there are so many reasons. It's true what someone said a moment ago. More things than we can count. I, I hope you always notice the sign out front. We put a message out there to get people thinking about what we should be thinking about. And what's out there now is to to spend time counting your blessings and not airing your complaints. Because, folks, can you imagine how much better off our world would be if people would just stop complaining a little bit? Can you imagine? Can you? I mean, wouldn't that just be a little bit of heaven on earth, just a little bit? You know, just less complaining. Okay. Turn with me in, to, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians this morning, please, as we look at this idea of giving thanks. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to start reading down in verse 10. So if you'll stand with me in honor to the Lord and His Word. If you don't have a Bible, please use one of the pew Bibles there. We want you to see the Word of God, hold it in your own hands and see it for yourself. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, and by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Now listen to this. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Father, it is true what's already been said. We have so, so many blessings. It would be difficult, if not impossible, for us to remember them all and think about them all. But we, are, we do know this. We may not be able to remember all those, but we, we know this. We know that all those blessings come from you because your word tells us every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Now, Lord, as we look into this portion of your word, would you give us understanding? Would you open our eyes, minds, and hearts to understand why it matters so much that we be a thankful people? We have so many reasons to be thankful. May we never surrender that, never stop giving you thanks, and living that day, living that way each day as well, God. Would you guide us now as we speak your word, that you would use this word to speak to hearts and draw us to yourself, to do what you want us to do, to be who you want us to be, to live as the church that you want us to live like and be like, all for your sake, all for your glory, all for your honor, as we pray these things in the name of the Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, Master, Ruler, Creator, and Sustainer of the universe, and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul calls God's gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, indescribable. He says those last words of verse 15, indescribable gift. That's what he calls it. The two parts of this verse and this text are the, about God's gift and then our thanks. That's the two parts of it. Paul makes an astounding claim here in verse 15. That he says, God has given us a gift that can be called indescribable or unspeakable. The old, the old King James is unspeakable. There's no gift quite like it. It's in a category all by itself. It's the most glorious gift you could imagine. Would you all agree with that today? The gift of God's Son is the most glorious gift you could ever imagine. This gift is clearly identified for us in John 3.16. You know how that goes. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. God's Son is a gift that cannot be classified. It is unspeakably glorious. It is indescribably glorious. It is better than winning the lottery, folks. Amen? Now that was kind of tepid. It's better than the lottery, isn't it, folks? It's better. It's better than who wins the Super Bowl, the World Series, all that stuff combined. It's better than all that. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about it. This is truly a precious gift from God because through God's Son, you and I have eternal life. That's how it's possible. Now, can this gift really be called indescribable or unspeakable as the, as the King James calls it? Is Paul right to call this gift God's undescribable or indescribable, unspeakable gift, or is he just getting carried away with his own words here, his own imagination? 
Can it be called God's unspeakable gift? And yes, it can, because it was given by an unspeakably glorious person to an unspeakably needy people at an unspeakably great price to give an unspeakably great benefit, which is eternal salvation through God's gift. Now, I'd call that unspeakable, wouldn't you? It's amazing. But today the question is, how do we properly say thanks for such a gift as this? Here's this gift. You can't classify it. It doesn't fit into any category. It doesn't belong in any category we know of. God has given it. So how do we say thanks for such a gift as that? Well, Paul simply says it there in verse 15. He says, thanks be to God. That's what he says. Look at the words there with me. This is where we're going to camp out here. Verse 15. Thanks be to God. He says it. But when you stop to think about the greatness of this gift of salvation, the massiveness of this gift, it's bigger than what you could ever imagine, how it reaches from eternity to eternity, you might be tempted to say that Paul's words here are not enough to just say, thanks be to God for such a gift. You might say, well, that's, it, there's got to be more than that we could say. If I could sharpen the questions a little bit this morning, I would put it like this. Is this enough, is this sufficient, just to simply say thanks, as Paul does here in verse 15? Is Paul here responding adequately to this enormous gift, this great gift, by saying thanks be to God? Is that good enough to just say thanks be to God? Well, this morning, in answer to that question, I want to give you two principles to answer that. Here's the first one. First of all, I want to tell you that the verbal giving of thanks, what we say with our mouths and our tongues, is no small thing. This is no small thing. This is no small thing. That's what Paul is doing here. He's giving thanks to God. We've asked, is it adequate? Is it enough? Is it sufficient to simply say thanks to the Lord? Is that enough? I'm suggesting to you this morning that this thing of giving thanks to the Lord verbally is something that should not be besmirched, it should not be belittled, it should not be put down or denigrated. Folks, it's a lot bigger than most of us think. It's much more than just the simple words, thanks, coming out of our mouth. Here's the second question, the second part of this. I want to tell you today that the verbal giving of thanks does not exhaust or use up, or wear out, or run out of meaning when it comes to giving thanks. There, there's more to it than just saying thanks. The giving of thanks is not a small thing, not at all. It's a big thing. But there's more to the giving of thanks than just verbally saying with your mouth, your lips, and your tongue, thanks. So today, I want to show you a little bit about these two principles, that first of all, the giving of thanks is no small thing, not at all, never a small thing. And that secondly, there's more to giving of thanks than just the verbal expression of giving of thanks. So let's jump in here as we look at this phrase, thanks be to God. Let's look at this verbal giving of thanks here. This is no, as no small thing. It's not a small thing because the Bible constantly emphasizes it. If you want to know what does the Bible think is important, look at what it repeats. Look at what it says over and over and over again. Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that are important. It keeps repeating them. It's exactly what Paul does here. The Bible constantly stresses for us this verbal spoken giving of thanks. And it does so in several ways, by the way. One thing the Bible does is it gives us several examples of people, individuals, just giving thanks to God. The Apostle Paul is one of them. He does it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That's not the only place. Now I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open. Go with me to 2 Corinthians again, chapter 2. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at verse 14. Paul does this again here. 2 Corinthians, the book we're already in, go back to chapter 2 and look at verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. This man Paul is a marvel to me. I think wherever you find Paul, you will find a thankful man, no matter what he's going through. Paul's the kind of guy, if you just scratched him, he would bleed thanksgiving. That was Paul, and he got scratched a lot in his ministry, in his service to God, in his public ministry. If you want a clear, straightforward summary of Paul's sufferings on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all you've got to do is just stay there in 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 11. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verses 22 through 33, we won't read all these, he gives a long, detailed list 
of all the things he's been through and gone through and what he suffered because of his service to Christ. You'll find Paul detailing what he had to endure for the cause of Christ. Most of us have not come anywhere near this kind of suffering for Christ the way that Paul did. It just, it's just, it, it, you know how it is with us. If just one thing, just one thing goes wrong in our lives, what do we do? We give into depression. We give into griping. We give into complaining. Well, that's not the way I wanted it. That's not the color I wanted. That's not the flavor I wanted. It doesn't taste right. This car smells funny. Are we there yet? You know what I'm saying? Your kids have gone with you on a trip before, haven't they? I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. She's looking at me. He's touching me. All this nonsense. We gripe. Look what Paul says. He is beaten with whips here, beaten with rods rather. He's whipped to pieces many times. He's shipwrecked. Go down to verse 25, just the last phrase of verse 25. Here's, here's one way he does it. He says, a night and a day I have been in the deep. He spent the night and a day floating in the water from a shipwreck. This is what Paul has endured. Paul often talks about how worried he was, how threatened he was, how much he had to endure because of Christ. But here's the marvel of this. With all of his hardship, all of his pain, all of his suffering, hardship that you and I most likely will never come near in this life. With all of this, this man Paul just bled thanksgiving, always giving God thanks. When he said, thanks be to God, this was his natural tone, his natural characteristic, his regular attitude. We were talking about this in Sunday school Folks, I hope you all agree with me this morning. Thanksgiving is never, for the believer, just one day. Folks, it is every day, and let's go further. It should be more than once a day, should it not? More than once a day. God gives us things all day long. What if he stopped? You think it's rough now, try it without him. Paul just regularly gave thanks. You read a little while in Paul's letters, and you'll find him saying, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This is one way the Bible emphasizes for us how important it is for us to verbally say thank you to God. It may surprise you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ himself was also a man of thanksgiving. He was too. Now, Jesus is fully God and he's fully man, of course, in a category by himself. Nobody else like him. The God-man, like no other man who had ever lived, who is, or who is living now or ever will live. The Lord Jesus Christ is unique in all of that. You would think that if ever there was anyone who have, who would ever have lived that would not need to give thanks, you would think it would have been the Lord Jesus after all, right? Because he was in such a special category and because he's fully God, Thanksgiving would seem to be beside the point, would it not? Because it would be almost like him thanking himself. But he gives thanks to God the Father constantly throughout his public ministry. Over and over again, he thanks God. He thanks God the Father. And even though he is the God-man, yet for the purpose of of our redemption, he humbles himself, he stoops down to the place where he became voluntarily dependent on the Father. So he wasn't constantly giving thanks to the... So he was constantly, rather, giving thanks to the Father. Go with me to Matthew chapter 11 just a moment. Matthew 11... And verse 25, Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. There it is. He says these things, you've kept these things from others. He's talking about the truth of God. I have to smile when I read that verse 25 in Matthew 11 because you know the movers and the shakers of our society are so proud of themselves. Oh, they are so sure. They are so smart, so intellectual, so insightful. Why, they've got it figured out. They've got it all figured out. And if you don't think they've got it all figured out, just ask them. They'll look you right in the eye and say, yeah, we've got it all figured out. We've got it all figured out. But for the most part, these people have not received the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've said no to that. We don't need that Bible stuff. Why don't you just keep that in the church? We don't need to hear that outside the church. Well, who has received it? People like us. People who are not among the movers and the shakers, the rich and the famous, the intellectuals and the powerful. Go to Luke chapter 10. Here's another verse. Luke 10. 
Jesus says this again here. Luke 10, verse 21. Luke 10, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. There it is. Now, this will make you thankful just to realize that the Father is the Lord of heaven and earth. Go to Luke 22. This is where Jesus is beginning the Lord's Supper. We have used these verses whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper here. Go to Luke 22 and look at verse 17. Luke 22, verse 17. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Drop down to verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is where Jesus starts something that we celebrate several times each year. Just a few verses. Now, this is not a complete list. Go with me to John 11. You know the story. John 11, we've just been through this Gospel of John for quite a while, for many months now. We just finished that last Sunday. Go to John chapter 11 and look at verse 41. John 11, verse 41. The friend of Jesus, Lazarus, has been dead for four days. He's in the tomb for four days. And Jesus stands there outside the tomb, and He says these words in verse 41, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up His eyes and said, Father, I thank You that You have heard me, and I know that You always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that You sent me. He says, I thank You, Father. Over and over He says this. On and on we could go here. The verbal giving of thanks is important. This is a big deal. It's not a small thing. It's a big deal. And the Bible emphasizes it. Paul did it. Jesus did it. You remember that story back in Luke's gospel? This is in Luke 17. Ten lepers come to Jesus. He heals them all. All ten of them are healed. And what happens? Nine go away and only one comes back. And the one that comes back is not even Jewish. Man, he's a Samaritan. One comes back and he gives thanks to Jesus. In Luke 17 and in verse 16, he says... He fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Folks, this is what we're talking about here. Now, some of you might be saying, well, those nine lousy bums, those nine lousy rats, what kind of low-down, filthy crumb bums were those guys that just walk away after being healed? They don't even turn around and say, thank you? What kind of people is that? are those guys? But I would say to you that, you and I are blessed much more than being healed from leprosy, folks. If you're sitting here saved, you have been saved for something much, much worse than leprosy, have you not? Leprosy doesn't last forever. But separation from God because of sin lasts forever and forever. So how are you doing when it comes to giving thanks? Are you better than these nine who walked away after being healed? This one Samaritan came back, the most unlikely of the group of ten. He alone comes back and he alone expresses his thanks and he's been held before us as an example of what we ourselves should do. Folks, I hope you are grateful every day and multiple times a day. Have you stopped to think lately about something that we take for granted like running water? Have you been thankful for that? There are people sitting in this room right now that can tell you the running water they had was you ran out to the well and you got it and brought it back. Are you thankful for electricity? I sure am. All these are examples of the verbal giving of thanks. It's no small thing. It's a big thing. The Bible also gives us several guidelines or ways of this very thing of verbally expressing thanks. The Bible tells us how to do this verbal giving of thanks. The Bible shows us the ways this can happen and, and, and how this can be done. Do you realize that there's more than one way to verbally express thanks? There's more than one way. Let's look at some scriptures again. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and look at verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13 and look at verse 15. The writer says, Therefore by Him let us continually Offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name, he says. This is one way that we verbally give thanks. We speak our thanks. We give thanks to His name, the fruit of our lips. 
Hold your place in in Hebrews 13. Go with me to Psalm 95. Go to Psalm 95. Here's Psalm 95, verse 1. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God. And the book of Psalms has lots and lots of words about giving thanks. We would just look at a few of them this morning. How many ways are there to verbally express thanks? They're speaking the words thanks, like we found right here in Psalm 95, when he says, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully. But there's also that first part. He says, let's sing to the Lord. Now, this is where I want to have something very particular to say about singing. The Bible gives us different ways to verbally express our thanks. And a big important part of verbally expressing is not only speaking our thanks and testifying our thanks to the Lord, but it is the singing of our thanks. Amen? Are you sure? (laughs) Singing to the Lord. A big important part of giving our thanks is singing to the Lord. There's nothing sadder than a Baptist who won't sing. There's nothing sadder. I want you to understand that you are under a commandment from God. Look at those words in verse 95. Let us sing to the Lord. There it is. Let us sing. We are under a commandment from God whenever we are in public worship to sing. Sing! Oh, I know what people say. Oh, I know. Well, I just like to hear other people sing. I don't like to hear myself sing. I just like to hear other people sing. But the Bible says you sing. You sing! It's part of worship. It's command from God. Others say, well, I can't sing. I don't sound very good. The Bible covers that too. Go with me to Psalm 100, just a minute. Psalm 100, verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. There it is. No options, no escape clauses. It says make a joyful noise, a joyful shout unto the Lord. If you sit there like a bump on a log and refuse to sing, you are disobeying God, folks. It's as plain as that. Well, I don't sound very good. This is not about a talent contest. This is about singing to our God. He deserves it, does He not? He deserves it. There's a hymn we sing in our hymn book from time to time. It says, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. Who never knew our God. I'll tell you what. I'm almost afraid not to sing when I'm in church, because I'm afraid if I don't sing, somebody will look at me and say, well, that person doesn't know the Lord at all. He won't even sing. He must not know God. Folks, I don't know about you, but I want to be called, or or rather counted among the redeemed. So when Brother Rob tells us an uh, announcement, uh, or rather he announces a hymn number for us to sing, folks, I'm going to sing. Now, there have been times, some of you know this, you've been with us for a while, you know that there's been times when my, vo- my voice has been so stretched and strained and, 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 and I don't feel like singing. Even then, I just move my lips a little bit at least. This is a commandment from God. This is a command. And it's one way we can verbally give thanks to God. Go with me to Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verse 1. Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all peoples. Now, folks, I think it repeats for a reason, does it not? The the Lord above wants to hear His people sing to Him. That's what He wants. There you have those two things, speaking and singing. Declaring, proclaiming, singing. Speaking our thanks and singing our thanks. Go back to Psalm 100 just a moment. Those opening verses say it. Make a joyful shout, a joyful noise. Serve the Lord with gladness. We are to sing our thanks unto God. The Bible constantly urges us to do this. Now some people say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I just don't feel like singing. Ever heard that? I don't feel like singing. You don't know what I've been through this week. You don't know how hard my week was. Here's what I will say to them. You don't understand. You sing, and you'll start feeling like it. Sing, and you'll start feeling like it. Folks, if I waited till I felt like doing things, you know what? I never got out of bed in the morning, come to this office. I never would. If I waited till I felt like it. There are so many things I would never do if I waited until I felt like doing them. How about you? You like that? 
So what I find is necessary is to act on the basis of duty and responsibility. And whenever I begin acting on the basis of principle, I do this because I'm responsible to do it. Feeling comes along and it follows all that. There are way too many people who rely on their feelings in their Christianity. If you are one of those who relies on your feelings in your Christianity, I'm just here to tell you this, and you've noticed this, haven't you? The devil will work overtime to make sure you don't feel like doing anything for God now, won't he? You know that. He'll work extra hard to make sure you don't feel like it. He'll make extra, he'll work extra hard. He'll make sure you don't feel like doing anything for God at all. But if you live on the basis of what the Word of God tells you to do, that feeling will come in due course. You just keep plugging along, do what the Lord wants you to do, don't worry about your feelings. It's like a train, and the feelings are like the caboose, but the principle is the engine. Now, you've noticed this, haven't you? You know what? Trains can run without a caboose. Have you noticed that? They can run just fine without a caboose. If you make principle the engine, your Christian life will go along whether you feel like it or not. So here's some commandments from Scripture about the verbal giving of thanks. We're to speak our thanksgiving. We're to sing our thanksgiving. Here's another one. We are to pray our thanksgiving. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4. If you want to turn there, Philippians chapter 4, listen to what he says down here in verse 6. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Well, the Bible not only gives us examples and different ways to offer verbal thanks, it also gives us different places where the verbal thanks is to be offered and given. You are to give thanks to the Lord individually, individually. In your own private life, when nobody else is around, you should be thankful to God, should you not? Even when you're by yourself. Do you do this? Are you thankful? Do you find yourself giving thanks to the Lord individually and privately? Here's another way. You're to give thanks to God in your family, when you're with your family. Back there in the book of Deuteronomy, way back there, if you want to go back there, it's Deuteronomy chapter 6. Moses was led by God to tell the people of God how they were to conduct themselves. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he spells this out for them. He says in verses 6 and 7 of Deuteronomy 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. He says you moms and dads ought to be setting this kind of example in front of your kids about being thankful. You want to know why more people aren't? Because they were never taught that way as a kid. Now were they? They weren't. And God says that's our job. We're to be talking about the things of the Lord. Do you do this with your family? Is there a giving of thanks? And, and I'm not talking about this cheap stuff either. Rub dub dub, thanks for the grub. Uh uh-uh, uh, none of that. Good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat. Uh uh-uh, uh, none of that. No, no, no. Is this a natural part of your conversation? Just to notice the blessings of the Lord and say, Hasn't the Lord been good to us? You could do that with your own family, could you not? God has been good to us. The Bible tells us. We need to do this in our families. Here's another way. The Bible tells us that we need to do this in public worship. I've labored on this one for quite a while now, but I don't mind laboring over it again. Some people say, well, I can worship the Lord just as well at home as I can at church. And you know what? The Bible's got an answer for that. No, you can't. No, you can't. Well, now, wait a minute. I can worship the Lord. I'm out in the woods hunting. Really? Why well, I can worship the Lord when I'm out on the lake fishing. Oh, really? I can worship the Lord when I'm out on the golf course. I'm visiting the Green family, all 18 of them. Ha, ha, ha. No, no. Go with me to Psalm 87, just a moment. Psalm 87. For those who say, well, I can do this anytime I want, anywhere I want. Listen to this. Psalm 87. The Lord talks about this very thing. He says this in verse 1. Psalm 87, verse 1, His foundation is in the holy mountains, verse 2, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. More than all the dwellings of Jacob. You've got all these dwelling places where the people of God live. They're supposed to be worshiping God in those places and praising Him in their dwelling places. And God likes that, but He loves it when we come to His house, the gates of Zion. When we come to His house, that's the public side of it. 
And God has a special delight in public worship. You and I who know the Lord have a special delight in public worship because God does. That's why we love it, because God loves it. So the Bible gives us several guidelines and ways of doing verbal thanks, speaking, singing, praying with thanks. It also gives us places where we can do it individually in your family, in public worship. And the Bible also talks about the degrees to which it is to be practiced. How much of this giving thanks do we do? Go back with me to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, and look at that verse 15 again. Did you see how the writer said it? Hebrews 13, 15, he says, By him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Continually, he says. Constantly giving thanks to God. I don't think that means that there's nothing else we can ever talk about. Nothing else can ever come out of our mouths. Folks, we can talk about weather, we can talk about politics, we can talk about a lot of other things. But I think that that means on a daily basis and several times a day, simply praise ought to come out of our mouth for what God has done for us and for who God is. But praise is not only to be constant, it is to be abundant. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7. Colossians 2 and verse 7. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. There it is. Abounding in it. Paul is talking about our walk with God. We all are known for abounding in something. You know this. I know most of you fairly well, and by now you know me fairly well. I can look around at people here in this church and say, that person abounds in this or this person abounds in that. Well, I can look at Brother Richard sitting up here and I can say, now this is a man who abounds in money. He abounds in money. If you need any, just ask him. Ask him to borrow some. Now that's a joke. LaDonna's about to pass out, so don't. that's a joke, folks. That's a joke. That's a joke, okay. But there are some people who abound in pleasantness in this church. You know what I'm talking about. What a delight they are to be around. It seems like no matter how beaten down they are, no matter how many problems they're going through, you can't keep them down. They are pleasant no matter what. They're just abounding in pleasantness. They're always concerned about helping someone else. Some of our church family abound in service and ministry to God and to others. They're always out there trying to find a way to help somebody. Now, some people abound in their interest in automobiles. You've seen people like this, haven't you? I heard a story about a guy like this. There's a fellow who was so interested in his automobile that he kept a little cloth in his back pocket so he could always go out there and wipe it down and rub it down every day. He would lovingly polish that car day after day after day. He'd even take it for a little drive and he'd bring it back after five or ten minutes. He'd get out, he'd polish that thing again. It might have picked up some road dust somehow. Walk around it, look at it again, just admire, admire it, smile at it. And when he was about to go into the door of his house, he would take one last loving look back at that car and say, Oh, look at that car. Now, folks, I think if I were his wife, I'd shoot him, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm pretty sure he didn't show her that kind of attention, okay? But he abounded in that. You know other people, they abound in sports. They can tell you every score, every game, every player, every salary of every player. They abound in this. It's okay to abound in some of these things. But here's the thing we ought to be known for as Christians. We ought to be known for our abounding in thanksgiving. Amen? Shouldn't we? (laughs) We should be known for that. Let me ask this question. When people think of you, do they say, now there's somebody, there's somebody who abounds in thanksgiving. Man, there's just thanksgiving pouring out of them all the time. I can't be around him for 10 seconds without some kind of word of thanksgiving coming out of him. It just abounds in him. He's always expressing thanks about things. Now, you know the other side of that, don't you? You've been around the other side of it, haven't you? People who abound in griping and complaining and whining. You can't be with them five minutes before somehow they're griping about something. You know people like that? I got family like that. Okay? They're complaining, something's not right, somebody's done something wrong, it's their fault, it's never them. They're not treated right. You know how this goes. They abound in griping and grumbling and complaining. Now, the people of Israel did that back in the Old Testament. You know what God did to them? He judged them for complaining and griping and grumbling. Amen? Now, He did that. He did. Be careful what you abound in. Paul says we're to abound in thanksgiving. Last thing here, then we'll pray. 
we said that first of all, this is no small thing to verbally express our thanks. But I want to say to you, that's not all there is to it, just to express it. It's very important. The Bible constantly emphasizes this. But the verbal giving of thanks does not exhaust or empty or drain the meaning of giving thanks. There's so much more to it than that. Go back there with me one last time to Hebrews chapter 13. Look back at that verse one more time, then we'll pray. You'll find the author saying even more here. He talks about in verse 15, Therefore by Him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. There it is, praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. There's that, giving thanks to His name. But go further, verse 16. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He goes further. Now this next phrase in verse 17 is about going to knock some of you into next week here. He says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. One part of Thanksgiving is how we treat people who preach and teach the Word of God. Now, you know this. I told the pastor's class this morning, I thank God for this church. You have gone way, way out of your way to honor the Word of God, to honor the man of God the way you do. You honor him. You honor the work of the pastor. And folks, this is church like any, unlike any I've ever known before. You even honor the pastor's wife here. You do that. I'm just trying to show you that there's more to this than just giving thanks verbally. Verbally expressing it is good. It's pleasing to God. The Bible constantly emphasizes it. But when you've done it, you've not, you're not done. There's more. There's more to it. He says do good. He says share. Have you ever thought of the giving of your money to the Lord is as a means of thanksgiving? When we pass the offering plate every week, folks, that's a way to show our thanks to God. That's a way to show it. Do you realize that in churches today, less than 20% of the people who go pay for at least 80% of the bills. And the remaining 80 plus percent pay less than 20 percent of the bills. I dare say in light of that statistic that we have not yet seen that the giving of our money is giving thanks to God. Giving to the Lord's work is the expression of our thanks. When I give my tithe, my 10 percent, folks, I really haven't given anything yet according to what I owe because the Bible says I owe that to God. If you really want to get technical about this, when you go over and above that, when you go beyond 10%, now you're beginning to express thanks to the Lord for what He's blessed you with. Folks, think about what He's given you. Think of everything you've got is from Him. So on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we've got this indescribable gift. We've got a gift that cannot be classified or categorized. And Paul says, thanks be to God. That's what he says. We've asked ourselves this question. Is that enough to say, thanks be to God? And we've answered it by saying, Paul said, thanks be to God, but he he said more than that. He was doing something very important. He said, thanks be to God. That's not a small thing to say, thanks be to God, but there's more to it than that. There's more. Paul did not fail in that way either. You look at Paul's life and how he lived and how he taught, and you can see that he not only said it, but he lived it. People saw that in his life. And that's a responsibility that rests upon each of us to say it and to live it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we simply want to say on this Lord's Day before Thanksgiving, thank you. And not just on this Sunday, but every time we're together. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, in our men's group on Tuesday mornings, in our prayer group on Thursdays. Every time we're together, we want to be sure We never leave out that essential part of saying thanks verbally with our own lips, our own mouths, our own tongues to say thank you. And as we just sang a while ago, we see how the the therapeutic side of giving thanks helps us by counting our blessings and naming them one by one and being surprised at what the Lord has done and how it will change our heart and change our mind from griping and complaining to saying thanks and expressing our love for you. Lord, we're praying today that each person here does that. Not just once a year, not just on the last Thursday of November, but every day and several times every day. Because, Father, your own son said it, without you, we can do nothing. Without you, we have nothing. 
Without you, we are nothing. But oh, with you, oh, what a difference it makes to have Jesus in our life, to have Jesus sitting on the throne of our life, to have Jesus as our Lord, our Master, our King, to know that Jesus has paid the price for our sins and forgiven us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. To know that, to trust that, to believe that, that truly is an indescribable gift. And may we always be thankful for that. And yet, Father, we know there it's very possible today that someone is here and they've never trusted you. They've never asked you to save them. They've never asked you to forgive them. They've never surrendered to you. They think they can run things pretty good on their own when they can't. Dear God, I pray that in these moments as we sing to you, that you would speak to each and every heart and mind in this place. Every soul would be hearing from you in these moments now as we sing. That they would ask themselves, do I know him? Do I know this Jesus? Do I know this God man? Have I trusted him? And if I haven't, why haven't I? And that they would step out and stand up and give themselves to you today, God. For others who need to be a part of this church family, for others who need to be reconciled with someone else, to be at peace with someone else. No unforgiveness, no bitterness, none of that, but instead thanksgiving and love. Lord, whatever it is, wherever you're leading each of us, our hearts, our minds, would you now speak to us as we sing our thanks to you to do what pleases you. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.